speaker, right? That's the guy recording it for Harvard. Yeah. Okay, I've got it. Have you got it? Have a ladies restroom in the basement of the month. Well, have a ladies restroom in the basement of the month. Okay. And it's just you. I don't know. Chris. I lost it. Okay. Now it's okay. Can people hear me? Yes? Yes. Okay. Great job, heard... Alice. What? Okay. I did. It was echoing. So hello, everybody. Yeah. Now, I hope you all enjoyed this, the Radcliffe Revolution song. Thank you, Susie Underwood, for your enthusiastic performance. I'm Alice Abarbanel class of 1966, and the project director of the Radcliffe College Alumni Oral History Project. And I would like to welcome all of you. I don't know how many are here, but I think quite a few. In particular, hello to alumni from three major reunions, the class of 52, mm -hmm. your 70th, class of 62, you your 60th, so? and class of 72, your 50th. And also to the women we've interviewed, a special hello. I don't know many, how many of you are here. Welcome. I wish we all could wave. Thank you to the Crimson Society for inviting us to speak today. A big shout out to the Radcliffe Club of San Francisco, the only remaining Radcliffe Club in the world and the sponsor of the Oral History Project. We want to thank all the interviewers, transcribers, and the alumni we have interviewed. And finally, thank you to all the people, many alumni and friends who have contributed time and funding to make this project possible. So let me introduce um, today's speakers and um, describe the program. Um, now, I can't tell, Chris, is, is, is the slide up? I just can't see it. Um, slide three. Thank you. So let me introduce everyone. So first, Julie, class of 66. You want to wave, Julie? A member of the Radcliffe Club of San Francisco, an original oral history committee member and project writer, brilliant editor, and steady source of encouragement. She will talk about the project's history. I will then speak about the development of my understanding about the project's necessity. Who writes history? and who cares? And then I will share some alumni stories. We will hear from two dedicated and skillful interviewers. Their work is impeccable. They really enjoy connecting to the women they interview. That's Connie and Susie and lucky me, they're a lot of fun. Susie Underwood, class of 72 is next. She's also a 50th reunioner. What a difference two decades make and Connie Gibb, class of 66. She's the first alumna to join the interviewer team. In other words, Connie and I were doing the interviews. 
diversity such as it was. Then I'll give an update and some other reflections. And finally, we'll have time for questions and answers using the chat. And um, Chris Sawacki will be monitoring the chat and the HAA behind the scenes who are fabulous support staff will be collecting comments and questions. And if you can include your class year with your name. And if you want to put, if you've been interviewed, so we'll know if um, how that goes. This is the second year reporting to the alumni in the Crimson Society about the Radcliffe College Alumni Oral History Project. This year, we have many others listening to who are not familiar with the project. With that in mind, Julie Cheever, our first speaker, will be describing in more detail the history and setup of the project. The mission of the Oral History Project is to record the undergraduate lived experience of Radcliffe College alumni from 1941, that was our oldest alum, through 1979, which is the last year they had a separate Radcliffe Admissions Committee. When we reported a year ago to the Crimson Society, we had completed 50 interviews in what we call phase one, which is alumni in the classes of the 40s through 62. Why did we stop at 62? That's the very last year they had a separate Radcliffe diploma, which was written in Latin. In 63, the diplomas at Harvard. By the end of 2021, we, the project, completed 101 interviews, and we're happy to announce that this phase is now completed. And in January, the recordings and transcripts were sent to the Schlesinger Library. The next phase will be alumni in the classes of 63 through 70, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So now Julie Cheever will now talk about the history of the project starting on our next slide. Julie, you're muted. You have to unmute. Thank you, sorry. Okay. So I said, hi everyone. <laughs> and then I also said, this project is now three years old, perhaps somewhat to the surprise of those of us who've been working on it. It began on a very small scale and it's now grown to include interviews of alumni all over the country. And as Alice mentioned, this year we reached the milestone of completing the first group of 101 interviews. Some of you may have heard our Crimson Society program last year. As we said then, this project has been a volunteer effort initiated and carried out by alumni volunteers. For instance, those first 101 interviews were done by nine volunteer alumni interviewers, including Alice, Connie, and Susie on this program. And I want to mention that they, along with Diane Franklin of the class of 1966, did the majority of the interviews. One reason for the growth of the program has been the tremendous interest from Radcliffe alumni. Many alumni want to hear, preserve the history of the college and have been concerned that it seems to be disappearing from memory at the university. We have found a lot of enthusiasm from alumni, both wanting to be interviewed and being very pleased when they are interviewed and also wanting to support the project. So about Radcliffe College itself, in brief, you may know that it was founded in 1879 as a so-called Harvard Annex for women. And you heard about the Annex in the opening song. Then in 1894, Radcliffe was chartered as a degree granting college. For the next 50 years, Harvard professors gave separate classes for Radcliffe women in the Radcliffe Yard. But in 1943, the classes were made coeducational in what was known as joint instruction as a wartime measure. I think Harvard at the time didn't like using the word coeducation. In the next part of this program, you'll hear a bit of an interview with a member of the class of 1946 who experienced this change from separate classes to joint instruction. Although the classes became coeducational, Radcliffe women 
we're subject to a quota of a four to one ratio of men to women for about three more decades. Finally, in the 1970s, the quota was loosened and then abolished. The combining of dormitories, administration and admissions also began in the 1970s. And the oral histories will end, as Alice said, with the class of 1979. Thus, the histories show the transition of Radcliffe from a separate college to the somewhat unusual three decades of co-education with a four to one ratio and a separate administration, and then to almost complete co-education and the near disappearance of Radcliffe in the late 1970s. And the interviews show the quite varied memories and reactions of alumni to what Radcliffe was like in their particular time during this trajectory of change. The project's beginning three years ago was inspired by a meeting of the Radcliffe Club of San Francisco in the spring of 2019. At this meeting, Alice found herself sitting next to some interesting women from the classes of the 1950s and started wondering what their experiences at Radcliffe were like. Four of us who were members of the club formed an informal committee to talk about how we could record the histories of some of the older alumni in the San Francisco Bay Area. At the time, we initially planned just to interview local alumni. We developed a mission statement and a prototype of an interview guide. This committee also made a couple of decisions that shaped the project. One was to focus on the undergraduate experience of alumni rather than what they did later in life. And another was to make the oldest alumni the top priority. So that led to phase one being the classes of the 1940s through 1962. Phase two will be 1963 through 1970 and phase three, 1971 to 79. And another key step in the project came in the fall of 2019, when the Radcliffe Club of San Francisco provided a crucial grant of seed money. This grant paid for consultation with an oral history expert and professional transcriptions of the first few interviews. In early 2020, Alice, who eventually became the all volunteer project director, contributing countless hours to the project, and thank you, Alice, began, conducted the first four in-person interviews of alumni in Berkeley and San Francisco. But then the pandemic struck. Ironically, the virus forced Alice and the other interviewers to figure out how to conduct the interviews by Zoom or telephone. And that, in turn, combined with the enthusiastic response from alumni, enabled the project to expand to alumni all over the country and even overseas. The interviews cover three general topics. First, the alumna's experience of undergraduate Radcliffe College life. Second, her undergraduate academic experience. And finally, her retrospective view of her college experience. Of course, these accounts are also set against the outside events of the time from World War II for our earliest alumni to the movements and cultural changes of more recent times. Each alumna gets a copy of the transcription of her interview and the picture of a Radcliffe woman with a banner that you saw at the beginning of the program is on the cover of each booklet and you'll see that picture again later. And those same transcriptions are sent along with the recordings to the Schlesinger archives. So this has been a brief look at the history and makeup of the project. In the next parts of the program, you'll hear about some of the things we have learned and next steps. And as we press on with phases two and three, <clears throat> we feel confident that the project is contributing both to Radcliffe history and also to the broader history of higher education for women in the United States. And so now back to Alice. Alice, you're on mute. Yeah. Um, now I'm, well, I'm actually, I forgot a paragraph. Can I say it? Which yeah. is that 
Radcliffe <laughs> fits in with yours. Radcliffe history is kept in the Radcliffe College archives at Harvard's eminent Schlesinger Library on the history of women in America, which is housed in our former Radcliffe Library. In the fall of 2019, Alice was able to visit the Schlesinger, and she'll talk about that visit after this. Oh, good. But I'm glad. I want to add that in 2020, the Schlesinger Library awarded the project one of its four honorary oral history grants for that year. Okay, now back to Alice. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Yeah. Okay. So um, thank you. And uh, we um, let's go to my slide five. So who writes history and who cares? How do you imagine Radcliffe College alumni respond once they hear about the oral history project? Almost everyone to a woman wants to be interviewed. She wants to tell her story. She wants her story to matter. This project has tapped into a wellspring of the interest, the community, and the strong feelings of Radcliffe College alumni. So you just heard Julie's excellent history of the project, and I'm glad you mentioned, Julie, my visit to the Schlesinger Library in the fall of 2019. I went to what was a newly opened, remodeled, beautiful Schlesinger Library right pre-COVID, little did I know. So first I asked, said, to, I said, is there anything about Radcliffe about in the archives of the Radcliffe College archives for information about undergraduate life? Well, first they mentioned and showed me a book written by Dorothy Howells, class of 60, and Dorothy, I hope you're here today, um, entitled A Century to Celebrate, Radcliffe College, 1879 to 1979. That Dorothy gathered priceless photographs and wrote a well-researched history of the college. I recommend it highly. So then I said to the librarians, are there any oral histories? There was one project that contained written questionnaires plus 12 oral histories for the class of 43 that they completed at their 50th. Then came what I call a moment for me to remember. The Schlesinger librarian in charge of the Radcliffe College archives said to me, there is nothing in the archives about the lived experience of Radcliffe women for the second half of the 20th century. Well, I was stunned. I think I said something like, really? Are you kidding? Nothing? And today I realize I should not have been surprised. At the very beginning of the project, my main concern was getting the project going, completing the interviews, contributing to the archives. It felt urgent to all of us. The alumni from the 40s are in their 90s. Well, in the last year, my eyes have been opened to the systemic gaps and absence of recorded Radcliffe undergraduate women's history in the Schlesinger's Radcliffe College archive and at Harvard and by Harvard. But before I continue, I want to be clear about the Arthur and Elizabeth Schlesinger Library on the History of Women in America. Google it. It is a treasure. The Schlesinger librarians that work directly with us, Jenny Gottwalls and Sarah Hutchins, are expert researchers and archivists. All the Schlesinger librarians welcome these oral histories and we are grateful. So in this talk, when I say the Schlesinger, I am usually referring to the Rack of College archives at the Schlesinger. In these archives, much is included, annual reports, student publications, Radcliffe quarterlies to Radcliffe registers. You can Google that, the Radcliffe College archives. What is missing? The documentation of the lived experience of mid to late 20th century Radcliffe College undergraduate life. It isn't the Schlesinger Library that excluded these histories. It is an absence, a gap. Nobody gathered this data, that is my point. Before our project, nobody else that I know about had submitted a project like ours to the Radcliffe College archives. Our intention is to fill that gap. The stories we will share today demonstrate the particular complexities of these women at this time in Harvard and Radcliffe history and the history of higher education for women in America. This past year, many factors have contributed to the evolution of my thinking and my feeling about the urgency about recording Radcliffe history and oral history in particular. I will name just three of them. 
First, discussions with Dr. Joy Casson, Professor Emerita of American Studies at UNC Chapel Hill and my class of 1966 classmate. Joy helped me organize my own thinking about oral histories and the work of historians. I wanna take the opportunity in this Zoom to say to you, Joy, thank you. Second, the work of Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, a Harvard professor emerita. And third, a podcast by Matea Wong of the Harvard Crimson class of 2022. So I have time today to share a very few highlights from both Laurel Ulrich's and Matteo Wong's ideas. Both of them deserve more time and study. I hope my brief introduction to their work will encourage you to explore. The links to both their work can be found in the chat. So the work by Laurel Ulrich that influenced me is a book many of you know called Yards and Gates, Gender and Harvard and Radcliffe History published in 2004. It is a collection of memoirs and essays. Laurel Ulrich is a distinguished scholar of women's history, writing about people who were neglected in traditional narratives. She received a Pulitzer Prize in 91 for a midwife's tale. And in 1995, she accepted a position at Harvard and in 2006 became a university professor in recognition of her interdisciplinary scholarship and teaching. So what did Ulrich find at Harvard? Well, two years after she arrived, she attended a ceremony for the renovation of the Barker Center, the former freshman union, and noticed there were no portraits of women except for one of Elizabeth Barker, who had funded the renovation. After the ceremony, she reports that everywhere she turned, she saw what she called, quote, a curiously constricted sense of what belonged to Harvard's past. So her observations prompted her first to write a paper for a conference, and then she revised it and printed. It was printed in the Harvard Magazine in 99, and it's entitled Women's, Harvard's Womanless History. That's what this thing says. You can see it down there on the left, and that's the cover of the Harvard Magazine that has this essay in it. A version of her essay became the introduction to her book, Yards and Gates. She provides a way of understanding the absence of Radcliffe undergraduate oral histories at the Schlesinger. And I just wanna read out loud this quote on the slide. History is limited, not only by what we can know about the past, but also what we care to know. Womanless history has been a Harvard specialty. So what I care about, the Radcliffe College alumni's lived experience of undergraduate life we want them added to the historical record. The other work I want to mention is the 2022 Harvard Crimson Magazine podcast entitled The Annex. It's cr created by Matteo Wong, who is a very, very recent Harvard alumnus yesterday, class of 2022. This three-part podcast was in part a response to the controversy this last year about the rebranding of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. This controversy made many Radcliffe alumni, including me, think not only about names, but also about Radcliffe's place in Harvard's history. The podcast also includes very thorough episodes on the history of Radcliffe and on the non-merger merger of the 1970s, as well as what he calls the unnaming. Wong notes the gaps documented by Ulrich, and he asks more specifically, who writes Harvard's history? He asks and he answers, who is included and who is excluded? Who has the power to write Harvard's history and how is that changing? I hope you all will listen to this podcast. Of course, we put a link in and actually you can just Google Harvard Crimson, the Annex podcast. Okay, now for some Radcliffe history and some stories from alumni. After I get a tiny bit of water here. Rachel Rifko from class of 72 sent me this comment. I think she phrased it very well. We can use oral histories to observe the slow and bumpy merger of Harvard and Radcliffe, what the experiences were at each bump, what was lost and what was gained. 
Let's look at some Radcliffe historical milestones, the bumps, and then listen to the lived experience of these moments by the undergraduates we interviewed in phase one. The first example is before joint education and once it began. So 1943 was the beginning of official joint education, as Julie mentioned. And they were combined in response to the reduced faculty due to World War II and some financial stuff. But I, you should know this arrangement was intended as temporary. And it wasn't until 47 that it became an established policy. And as Julie mentioned, until joint education began, Harvard professor had come to the Radcliffe Yard to give separate lectures for the women students. So first a story from the oldest woman that we interviewed, Evelyn Richmond, class of 41. Evelyn died last February at the age of 100 years and eight months. I interviewed her in 2020, a month before she turned 99. She graduated two years before joint education and she maintained in no uncertain terms that she had a Harvard education. Quote, well, we used to joke about the fact that we had the same courses that they had at Harvard. We had the same professors giving them. They used to give their lecture at Harvard, walk across the commons to Radcliffe and give us the same lecture, except for the dirty jokes, unquote. She said this, with a twinkle in her eye. And now let's hear from Mimi Greenman Grosser, class of 46. Mimi is an age 97 now, and I hope you're here today, Mimi. She started college when the Harvard professors gave separate lectures. Her sophomore year, joint education began. But before um, I tell, we talk about the joint education, I want to give you a hint of what it was like in 42 Cambridge when she arrived at Radcliffe. There were servicemen everywhere in Boston and Cambridge camping on Mass Ave. They were everywhere. Okay, please play audio one. Well, the Harvard undergraduate experience was very different from what it was at any other time in history because there were thousands of them. And they were they were all in service academies, uh, so I, I mean, so to me, coming from a girls' high school, I thought I'd die going to heaven. So that's Mimi starting her education, and now she hears Mimi talking about the challenges of joint education on audio too. We were very much aware of was the fact that our status at Harvard was changing due to the war. Uh, that we actually were going to classes in a Harvard yard. Right. And that a lot of the faculty were pretty hostile to that idea. I mean, there were faculty members who were notorious for making the women feel uncomfortable in their classes. Right. I've heard of it. Did you have heard? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure you've heard all those stories. Well, I've heard about it, but have you heard? Did you? Is there one that happened to you? I did not experience it personally. Yeah, but you knew about it, so you oh, all. Oh no, yeah. Did you talk about it much amongst you, or were you too busy just studying and dating and being political or whatever? You well, know? it was more like if you're taking so and so's class, to watch out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was no which professors. Were, were nice nice to women students because you know they, they, their their male reserve was was being invaded for the first time thank you mimi and she added at the end it was just how it was it never occurred to us we could do anything about it and i assure you that's a refrain we heard from many of the alumni in phase one so the second example is joined extracurricular activities. They were officially joined in 58, 59. There was uh, some before, especially the Choral Society, but the official joining. Francis Webb, class of 1960 said, in my era, there were almost no joint extracurricular activities. And she knew many women who objected strongly to being denied opportunities they would have liked through the joint extracurricular activities. And here's what Allison Buckman, class of 1961, had to say, quote, after my freshman year, 57, 58, Harvard opened its extracurricular, extracurricular activities to Radcliffe. 
That was the end of the Radcliffe newspaper, the Radcliffe annual show, the Radcliffe radio station, etc. I had wanted to go to a women's college and get a Harvard education. Instead, I went to Harvard. And the last example, in the spring of 1961, Mary Sumetti, class of 1962, was the first woman elected as a president of a Harvard Radcliffe undergraduate activity. What's interesting in retrospect, Mary remembered she even asked herself then, as a woman, can I do this? Because she was heard from other people that the deans at Harvard weren't happy about this that somehow her election was an invasion of the Harvard sphere on the part of Radcliffe that they didn't appreciate. She said, I was a bit cowed by that information and it didn't stop me from doing anything. She did complete her whole term as the, pres the president of Phillips Brooks House. And please remember our project is not about what we alumni did not have. It is about what we did experience and what was true. We can track in what ways was the separate Radcliffe College changing and what was it like for the undergrads. And my third example is not a milestone. It is a more complex experience involving cultural messages and assumptions. So this example is from two women who are in the reunion classes of 52 and 62. Carla Hurwitz, 52, and Minna Schrag, 62, shared their memories of President Jordan addressing their classes and his describing the reason for the women's Radcliffe education. But first, a bit of important recorded history. Wilbur Jordan was Radcliffe College president and a Harvard history pro professor from 43 to 1960. He took several steps that had positive effects on women undergrads, including working with the Harvard faculty to ease their many objections to joint education. He encouraged geographical distribution. He is credited with starting the Radcliffe College archives. He was a historian. And all these and other accomplishments are in the records of Harvard and Radcliffe history. So let's hear from Carla and Minna. Carla from the class of 52, when President Jordan addressed our class on the eve of graduation, he said that it was our job to bring up educated children. He said nothing about making the world a better place or anything else. If our only job was as Jordan charged, why were we educated? I thought that his direction was insulting to those of us who hope to have careers and it exposed his view of the women, of women, which angered me. In Minna Schrag, class of 62, she remembers Jordan's greetings and she thought at the beginning of the school year telling them that where they were being educated to be good wives and mothers. She said, I didn't dwell on it, it wasn't unusual. It wasn't different from a lot of the advice that was generally around in the culture. That we might aspire to do something that we cared about in addition to the wife and mother role was an idea that I think most of us absorbed gradually over the four years. Where'd we get that newer idea, she asked, partly from those of our classmates who were already determined to have serious work on their own and partly from things Polly Bunting said when she addressed us. So recording the past is complex. President Jordan's important contributions are recorded in written history. What has not so far been documented and has equal importance is what it was like for the women to hear those words from the college president as they gather together to begin or to graduate from college. Um, so history needs to have what's traditionally been recorded and the alumni's memories and reactions. And let me assure you that this kind of complexity has lots of examples in Harvard Radcliffe history. It is not at all just with President Jordan. We hear about it in many of the oral history interviews in a variety of circumstances with professors, we'll hear some of that today, with extracurricular activities and with access to libraries. Minishrag mentioned Polly Bunting, Mary or Polly Bunting, we need to say, was a scientist, a mother of four, a widow, and in 1960, she became the fifth president of Radcliffe College. You know, we don't have time to go into detail, but as you know, things changed under her presidency. A famous quotation from her at the time was that she observed a quote, climate of unexpectation for girls, which resulted in the waste of highly talented, educated woman power. That was the president of Radcliffe. 
She did much to advance women at Radcliffe, including founding the Radcliffe Institute for Independent Study, later called the Bunting Institute, in her honor, which after the merger became the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. So in conclusion, understanding the issues of what we care to know and of who writes that history has given me added motivation to complete this oral history project. And as I said at the beginning, this project has tapped into a wellspring of interest and of community. We cannot wait to record this history. The youngest women we will interview for this project, class of 1979, are turning 65. Sadly, with every year, there are fewer surviving alumni. I have received news that six of the women we interviewed have died. We also lost one of our interviewers and one of the original Radcliffe Club committee members. Let's pause for a moment and honor these alumni. Judith Singer Dror, class of 1975, an interviewer. Randy Milden, class of 1973, Radcliffe Club committee member. And the six women, the six alumni we interviewed, Evelyn Kravitz Richmond, class of 1941. Brenda Sartorius Engel, class of 1945. Joanne Keenan, class of 1945. Louise Untermeyer Frankel, class of 1949. Alan Summersby Emmett, class of 1950. Jill Neerum, class of 1960. I will end this section with the words of Radcliffe Club of San Francisco member Lucille Poskanzer. I see that you're here. Hello. She is quoted in the 2021 Harvard Magazine article about this project. She said that it was the first time someone had expressed interest in her Radcliffe experience, and she appreciated the opportunity to reflect on the institution in that time in her life. Undergraduate women definitely should read about it, but it shouldn't stop there, she said. I think the men need to know about it. I think it's important information for everyone. It's part of Harvard's history that many seem to have forgotten. Next slide. Here are the questions. Who writes history and who cares? And here's the answer. We care and we are writing history. Susie Underwood, one of our interviews, will now talk about what a difference two decades make. Thank you, Alice. All right. Are you? Yeah, thanks. Thank you for putting up my slide and thank you for that introduction. Uh, listening to the names of those six women we interviewed who have died was very moving, and I'm so glad we were able to interview them. I'm also glad <clears throat> that Alice talked about Carla from 52 and Minna from 62, both classes with big reunions this year, just like my class of 72. We all went to the same college, but what a difference those two decades made. I feel lucky to have been part of the Radcliffe Oral History Project since almost the beginning, not only because it is creating an important record for the future. Uh-oh, I got to plug in my battery, it says. Hold on. Sorry. True life interferes, um, not only because the project is creating an important record for the future, but also because it opened my eyes to what Radcliffe was like long before I got there. For all the reasons we need to study history in general, we also need to look at the lived experience of women at Radcliffe. Hearing in these interviews what it was like in the 40s and 50s I almost thought it wasn't the same institution I attended. From the start, interviewing was a fabulous experience. 
I was nervous before my first interview, which was with Pat Bourne from the class of 61 and from the San Francisco club. But as it turned out, we were having so much fun that we were on Zoom for almost three hours. Not all of it was the official recorded interview that probably lasted about an hour and a half. But then we stayed on after the recording was turned off. We had so much more we wanted to say to each other that wasn't included in the questionnaire. With every one of my interviewees, we stayed on and chatted for a while after the recording stopped. They wanted to ask about my Radcliffe experience and find out how it compared to theirs. We talked about things we had in common, especially those who had been in the Radcliffe Choral Society, as I had. And by the way, Alice was wrong when she said that that went co-ed because it never did. And in fact, it still even now is called the Radcliffe Choral Society. Um, anyway, I felt like there was an incredible connection with all of them, that I was making new friends and that if we lived near each other, we would certainly get together for tea. Many of the women invited me to come and visit them, and I think they meant it. It was fascinating to me that these women went to the same school I did at such a different time. The phase one interviews ended with the class of 62, who graduated 10 years before my class of 72. My oldest interviewee from the class of 49 graduated before I was born. Most of my interviewees were from the 50s. Between that time and my arrival at Radcliffe in 1968, much had changed. Some things were still the same. Curfews, parietal hours, wait-ons in the dining hall, sitting on the bell's desk, <clears throat> notifying dorm residents of phone calls and visitors. <clears throat> Parenthetically, all of those things vanished before I graduated. But many things were decidedly not the same. The stories they told about the way women were treated were shocking to me. The woman from 49 told me that in her classes, all the women were required to sit in the back of the room. Some professors would not call on them or even answer their questions after class. Admittedly, joint instruction had only started in 1943 and she was a freshman in 1945, so the professors were not used to having them there. Still, it seems outrageous that the women were not integrated into the classes. Women had no place to eat lunch in or near the yard. If they had afternoon classes, they had to walk back to Radcliffe for lunch or buy something in the square or bring food with them and eat in the basement of Mem Church. As I'm sure you all know, women were not allowed in Lamont Library until 1967. Linda Pastan from the class of 54, who went on to become a published poet and the poet laureate of Maryland, talked about her frustration at being excluded from Lamont. It had a poetry room where you could sit and listen to poems, but we weren't allowed to use it. I tried to argue my way into it, and I couldn't, and that was really hard to take. Most of the men weren't interested in listening to the poetry. That room was empty, and I couldn't go in and listen. That was the worst thing for me. And by the way, today is Linda's birthday, and it's a milestone one. I won't say what milestone. Happy birthday, Linda, if you're watching. It seemed that some professors didn't even try to disguise their misogyny. Here's a story told to me by Cynthia Stokes from the class of 56, who wonders if anyone else listening today was in that course with her. The course was hum four, ideas of good and evil, starting with Dante. At the first lecture in Sanders Theater, Professor Hugo said, would the ladies all please cross your legs? So we did, wondering why. Then he said, now that the gates of hell are closed, we may proceed. 
When she told me that, my jaw dropped. In my day, if a professor had some, said something like that, we would have hissed at him, or maybe even walked out, I'm not sure. But I don't think we would have just sat there like they did. Most of them knew how different and how much better life was for the men in the Harvard houses. But they didn't feel bad about their second class status. They all said that they were just happy that they were allowed to get this great Harvard education. It wasn't until years later that they looked back and started to get angry. In the final section of the interviews, which was a retrospective, they all said that they realize now how unfair it all was, but at the time they just accepted it because that's the way things were. In the same way, while my class would demonstrate and picket and yell about almost everything, it never occurred to us to think that we should have a shuttle bus that took us down to the yard and back. It was only later at a reunion when we learned that one had been started because the men living at Radcliffe complained that we got mad in retrospect. We were warned as early as freshman orientation that it was dangerous to walk across the Cambridge Common at night. And yet apparently that warning was considered to be all that was necessary rather than doing anything to solve the problem. A shuttle would have been great for safety and for bad weather. And yet Harvard only started one after the men moved up to Radcliffe and they didn't like the long walk. It had never occurred to us women to complain about the walk because that's just the way it was. No doubt we will learn more about changes in expectations and in the life of the Radcliffe undergrads in the upcoming phases of the project when we interview the women from the classes of 63 through 79. I'm excited for those interviews to begin. And now, here's Connie Gibb, who will talk about some of her interviews. OK, um, what's happened? Uh, hang on one second. Um, thank you, Susie. Um, oh, dear. What, I'm sorry. Um, in the years covered in the first phase of this project, Radcliffe made little effort to diversify the pop their population in the way that we think of diversity today in terms of racial and ethnic diversity. They rarely had more than one black student per year. Happily, that policy started to change in the 60s. Before that, diversity meant geographic, socioeconomic, religious, or diversity of academic interests. We have tried to interview a representative population, but the fact is that Radcliffe was not very diverse in those years. So I wanted to talk about two of the amazing women I interview. These two represent diversity, such as it was in Radcliffe's terms in those days. One was Kathy Yang, a Chinese woman from Shanghai. During the revolution in 1949, she and her family had to flee to Hong Kong. She had lived in the French concession in Shanghai during the Japanese occupation, where she had gone to English speaking schools. She continued in an English speaking school in Hong Kong. However, despite her schooling at Radcliffe, she found her English so deficient that it would take her an entire day to read a play like Major Barbara, because she had to look up so many words. On the other hand, she had no trouble in math and sciences. She easily got an A in Chem 20. However, when she found she wasn't getting more than a C in humanities, she sought help from a friend of a friend, a man whose name she remembers to this day. They walked for an hour in the rain. That was because he didn't have any money for coffee. And he ended up giving her a list of books that she should read. And, uh, encouraged her to read something every day, a habit which she does continue to this day, of course. But despite her reading, she realized that to really understand literature, like Major Barbara, you have to understand the culture it comes from, which can take a long time and you have to do it on your own. 
So at Radcliffe, she spent lots of time at the mu at museums on dates, as she said, very nice cheap dates, at the opera with her classmates and at music performances, all of which she continues. But she, um, she has gone on to become an important connoisseur and collector of Chinese art, a subject which she said it has basically taught herself. She loved Radcliffe and was thrilled by the intellectual environment she found in class and in the dormitories. How wonderful it was that Radcliffe took Kathy in the class of 1956 at a time when they told her they only had one Chinese student per class. And that student was usually someone who had lived in the US or maybe even been born in the States. She loved every minute of her time at Radcliffe and clearly enriched the lives of those who knew her as she has mine. The other woman I wanted to tell you about is Ann Roberts, who grew up outside Jackson, Tennessee, a town of about 11,000. She describes the school she went to as a very, very bad public school, dismal. Her parents hadn't gone to college, but one day, a bus took her and some others to Birmingham, Alabama to take some tests, which she now assumes were SATs. At that time, she'd never heard of SATs and she'd never heard of Radcliffe. But later she got a letter from Radcliffe asking her to apply. When she was accepted, she was very excited to go, but had no idea about what it would be like. She had never written an essay in high school. She had never taken a note in class or on her reading. She was incredibly poorly prepared for Radcliffe, although she had been a voracious reader. Luckily, she found friends to help her. One friend who visited Anne in Tennessee um, had quite an experience, including being interviewed on TV and proposed to on the way to the airport. Anne's family treated her friend to the local delicacy, squirrel stew, which she managed to eat despite having had a pet squirrel as a child. Anne and her world really did represent diversity to her Radcliffe classmates. Besides her friends, what really helped was that Anne took a course in Islamic history and law from Sir Hamilton Gibb and was thrilled and enlightened she proceeded to take every course that he gave and major in Islamic history and law. Anne was then encouraged by another professor to go to the American University in Beirut when she graduated, where she became the person that every visiting Harvard professor or student contacted when they visited Beirut. She lived and worked in the Middle East on and off for the rest of her life. Thank you, Radcliffe, for searching out and finding Anne. And thank you, Sir Hamilton Gibb, for exciting her interest in the Middle East. I guess what I wanted to say with these two stories was that despite its lack of diversity in today's terms, Radcliffe was trying to reach different students. A Chinese girl who had never lived in the US, a girl from rural Tennessee who had never heard of Radcliffe, these students were diverse in Radcliffe's terms, and they added immeasurably to the student body. And now back to Alice. Thank you, both of you, Susie and Connie, were great stories. They really continue to fill out our pictures of life at Radcliffe and all its diversity, at, as such as it was in complexity. Um, so let's do slide nine. So the photo on this is the transcription booklet we make for each alum. It is the final transcription in it that will, that's, will be archived in the Schlesinger Library. So first, a bit of an update. To remind all of you, Oral History Project has three phases. In phase one is finished. We sent everything to the Schlesinger, and they are already started to archive it. And we reached alumni primarily by word of mouth and tried to interview all the alumni we could find who were willing to participate. 
Phase two goes from 63 to 70. That's all the women who went to college in the 60s, basically, except 70 had one semester. We will work our way up class by class. We hope to start these interviews in the fall of this year. Phase three will go from 71 to 79. And we are reorganizing, updating our questionnaire, training new interviewers, organizing our digital infrastructure. Because we have a larger pool of alumni available for the next set of oral histories, our intention is to look for a very diverse sample from each class. We want a, this sample to include diversity of race and ethnicity, geographic diversity, and diversity in fields of concentration including the sciences and mathematics. We're aiming for a sample of 15 per class. Although we would love to do interviews of everyone who wants to participate, I do want to mention an alternative we've been working on with the Schlesinger, which is an option in which alumni can submit written histories of their undergraduate experiences. We would love to interview everyone who wants to be interviewed, and maybe one day we have well, we would be able to, but that involves funding. And that's what we, I want to mention, that we must do fundraising so that we can complete this project as we have planned. Most people don't realize that Harvard University and the Radcliffe Institute are not providing any money to this project. The funding we need pays for, among other things, transcriptions, the booklet, our new project manager, supplies and all kinds of technology to get the job done. Yes, the Schlesinger is allocating staff resources for archiving, but it is only the donations through the nonprofit 501c3 Radcliffe Club of San Francisco that will enable the project itself to be completed. And please go to radcliffehistory.org for more information about this. So what about oral? histories. This slide says it all. It's protocols, interviews, it's collecting historical material, it's an essential contribution to history. We are preserving, preserving an important part of human history. Writing this history is about preserving something special, and it matters to all of us. Oral history is also all of the things listed there, recollection, reminiscence, and storytelling. It's a personal conversation and a connection. We alumni have a story to tell about our time in Cambridge. We are documenting our lived history in our own voices. These histories give the human flavor of the historical realities along with the individual differences of women who experience these, change, these changes. The alumni express gratitude for these interviews. The interviewers are moved by connecting to the alumni and hearing their recollections. So next slide, please. As we end this Zoom, I have chosen two reflections from alumni we have interviewed. The first is from Ann Porter, class of 1962, the 60th reunion class, and one of three chairpeople of the Crimson Society. Obviously, I have met, emphasized today the mission of our project is has a clear focus to fill the gaps in the archives and to write our history. One of Ann Porter's reflections about the interview process spoke to another part of the experience, something deeply important that comes with any archiving of one's memories. For Ann, what it feels like to have her Radcliffe memories have a permanent home in the Schlesinger Library archives. Quote, basically, I'm glad to give my young self some sort of eternal life. It isn't really about me, it's about her. She was so lucky to be at Radcliffe. She had so much to figure out and her octogenarian self feels great love for her and for her college. And finally, I want us to hear from Jill Neerham, class of 1960. Jill died in April of this year. Please play radio, the audio. Well, I've cast aspersions at Radcliffe in different ways. So I guess I'd like to wind up <laughs> by saying thank you, Radcliffe. <laughs> that was a good experience. 
it was the most exciting world to be in. That was really quite a privilege. Thank you, Jill. And thanks to all of you. And next slide. You know, before we move to q and I'd just like us to remember it takes a village. I'm thanking all the alumni we have interviewed and all the phase one interviewers. And I want to name a few in particular. The Radcliffe class of 1966 donated our tri entire treasury and Lily Kent and Kathy Hughes made that happen. The Radcliffe Club of San Francisco, especially Kathy Henschel, class of 70, the treasurer, Julie Cheever, who you all know, and Patricia Bourne, who was originally a committee member. The Schlesinger librarians, Jenny Gottwalls and Sarah Hutchin, and the Crimson Society, Ann Porter, Randy Lindell, Ava Kampitz. And interview, I want to name a few individuals who have lent an extra hand of support. Ricky Grubb, class of 69, John Casson, class of 66, Patty Gelfand, class of 56, Patricia Greenfield, class of 62, Barbara Richardson, class of 66. And of course, Susie Underwood and the Radcliffe Revolution Chorus, thank you. And the HAA support team, thank you. And next slide, this is how to contact us, either me at the Rack of College Voices, and to support the project and for more information, just go to radcliffhistory.org.